On this episode of This Week in Space, we visit with Ralph Lawrence, mission architect for NASA's exciting Dragonfly mission to Titan. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 29, recorded September 16th, 2022, Flying on Titan. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Melissa. Make sure your customer contact data is up to date. Try Melissa's APIs in the developer portal. It's easy to log in, sign up, and start playing in the API sandbox 24-7. Get started today with 1,000 records clean for free at melissa.com slash twit. Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Space, the Flying on Titan edition. I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief at Ad Astra Magazine, and I'm joined by the indefatigable Tarek Malik, Editor-in-Chief at Space.com. Hello, Tarek. Hey, Rod. How's it going? Well, good. I hope you're taking care of my chair. What's that, good on well, you? I told you, it's got a, it's got a wonky wheel, but uh, uh, yeah, we're well, making it work, okay. right? I called a... Yeah, uh, Chief Engineer Scott came over with some some spit and bailing wire to, to to fix the warp core on this chair, but we're all we're all set. We're all set now with my Star Trek oh, chair. Man. So. Okay, your geek is showing. Well, today, <laughs> most importantly, we're going to chat with Ralph Lawrence with the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. Ralph is the mission architect for NASA's Dragonfly mission to explore Saturn's moon Titan. He also worked on the Mars InSight mission and is involved with Japan's Venus Climate Orbiter. That sounds cool. The Mars Rover Perseverance is an instrument there and leads a team on NASA's upcoming Da Vinci Venus probe. You're a busy man, sir. Welcome to the podcast. Hi there. Glad glad to be here. Very glad to have you here. Thanks for making time for us. So before we embark on our journey to the stars, I'm going to subject you to just one space joke today because people have only so much patience. So Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson went on a camping trip. After a good meal and a bottle of wine, they laid down for the night and went to sleep. Hours later, Holmes awoke and nudged his faithful companion. Watson, look up at the sky and tell me what you see. Watson replied, I see millions of stars. What does that tell you, said Holmes. Watson pondered for a moment and said, astronomically, it tells me there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Horologically, I deduce that the time is approximately quarter past three. Theologically, I can see that God is all-powerful and we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, I suspect that we have a beautiful day tomorrow. What does it tell you, Holmes? Holmes smiled ruefully and said, It tells me that someone has stolen our tent. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for the sympathy laugh. Okay, Uh, let's get on to some headlines before before I ruin the show. Artemis update. Uh, looks oh, like we have right. a current launch date set for September 27th with a backup That's a new for one. October 2nd. Has that if changed? That, if, no. Well, you know, you know, they were looking at September 20, uh, 23rd before. Right. And now it's a, it's almost a week later. Uh, September 27th was always a backup date for, for NASA, for Artemis 1. But um, uh, for the folks that have been following along, uh, NASA had a lot of stuff that had to go right to try to you know, make their third attempt to launch this mission on the 23rd. They had to fix a leak. Mm-hmm. Actually, they ended up fixing two. Um, and then they have to do a fueling test. And they were supposed to do it on September 17th. As we're speaking now, they did not get uh, through all the stuff they needed to to do that. So they've, they've fixed the leaks. Um, they fixed it on this this main 8-inch line and, and a, a 4-inch fuel line uh, where they found leaks on the recent countdowns. Uh, but... Uh, they just couldn't finish all the work they needed to do the filling test. Uh, and so they're going to push that to the 21st. And because that got delayed, you know, by, uh, uh, by half a week, then the launch gets delayed by half a week. And that's where we are now should say that they have to a pass that fueling test and B still get a waiver from the U S space force for their flight termination system battery check, which would require a, um, a rollback to the VAB to, to do that if they're forced to do it. So those are two big ifs still for this mission for them to fly on the 27th. And we're tracking Tropical Storm. I think it's Fiona now in the Atlantic, mm-hmm. uh, which which may or may not affect uh, NASA's plans because they have to make a decision to leave the pad if a storm is coming close several days before it, re- it reaches landfall. Uh, and that deadline could be coming up before the fueling test. So we're... 
We're tracking a lot of questions right now, but that's the latest Artemis update as we speak. All right. Well, thank you for that. And that can be found on space.com as can the next two stories. And let's just give NASA a pat on the back and say, take your time because we want this to be a success. Up next, DART mission update. So the DART spacecraft will fulfill its primary objective on September 26th, which is to impact a moonlet orbiting the asteroid Didymos. And it will be live on space.com and NASA TV, of course, which is really cool because we don't see things like this live very often, especially not not visually. Small change in the moonlet's orbit we will be evaluated by Earth-based telescopes. It was supposed to be evaluated by a companion spacecraft that got uh, canceled. That was from the European Space Agency. But they will be following up with another ast- uh, a spacecraft called HERA in, what is that, I think it's 2027? And then it's in a few years, yeah. So the Hera is yeah. like the the crime scene investigator for this this mission for Dart, uh, because <laughs> oh, you're such a journalist. Uh, well, um, you know, so on on September twelfth, which was a Monday, um, as we're recording this, uh, I actually went down to to uh, Johns Hopkins uh, APL actually uh, to meet with the Dart team there. They, they gave us a, a big preview of what it's going to be like. We saw the mission control center. The teams there are getting super excited they can see this asteroid now i think they're like 11 million miles away something like that something crazy um and uh and the asteroid uh, didymos is it's going to be the smallest asteroid we've ever rendezvoused with and uh, its moonlet is called dimorphos and they they picked this because if they hit dimorphos this tiny moonlet and they, they they're able to do it um they can measure the change in its orbit around the actual asteroid a lot easier than if they hit some other asteroid out there and then had to measure its movement around the sun. So it's kind of like a, a, a target of opportunity. And they seem very confident that this, uh, this long distance uh, Hail Mary is going to hit its target right now. Um, they, uh, uh, I spoke with the, the, the mission uh, uh, systems engineer uh, lead and, uh, and she told me that, you know, if they can see the asteroid, then they have a 91 to 99% chance of actually hitting dimorphous right now and they they can already see it in their cameras so uh so it's gonna be really exciting it's gonna be live on tv too which is rare mm-hmm. um but we're gonna have to wait for Hera, that that follow-up mission from the european space agency for several years to actually see uh the remains of whatever happens of the crater because Hera is gonna not only rendezvous with the asteroid system but also kind of stay there for a while and observe everything so we'll, we'll get a very clear idea of of what what we did to this asteroid at that point in time, but there is there is a little cube set called Leech Cube that was built by the uh, Italian space agency that is chasing Dart right now. They it released it just just a few days ago as we're speaking, mm-hmm. and um, uh, and that will take pictures also on the way. So maybe we might, we might get some views of the ejecta like we saw from the the um, the Deep Impact comet crash way back in what was that two thousand five something like that. So well, that is twenty fifteen uh, twenty going to be a very cool moment ralph since uh, these are both look your your mission and this are both down at johns hopkins are you your offices adjacent to theirs uh yeah they're just down the hall uh everyone here is very excited um i mean the big oh, thing that cool. dart is is going to measure is you know how how much more does uh the impact you know change the orbit than what you just expect by slamming a spacecraft of known mass at known speed into the into the asteroid because the, there's so much stuff thrown up the, the ejector from the explosion sort of amplifies that effect and um by by making a measurement of the um orbital period of of the 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 you know small asteroid um we can we can hopefully get uh, some some good estimates of that which will guide uh, future planetary defense efforts um but yeah it's a, it's a big big thing here i mean it's a you know, it's it's hard to get used to um uh having space missions go on that um that you launch and then like a year later all the fun happens um you know i'm used to working on uh cassini and and dragonfly where you know you start developing a project and it takes you know seven years to get to the launch pad and then it's another seven years before you get to actually do do the science so um you know i'm a little bit jealous of the the quasi instant (laughs) gratification that, that my colleagues are getting 
Well, and I was looking at the uh, the arrival date for for Dragonfly earlier today, and I thought, well, I'm going to be sitting on a veranda watching other people that can still move around and do fun things by the time that happens. But at least I hope I'll still be here to see it. Is there any I'll chance? Be there. I'll be there in my Star Trek wheelchair, Rod. So yeah, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I, uh, given that that Dimorphos is a, a moon moonlit circling Didymos, is there any chance? that the impact will occur and we'll discover that it's a rubble pile or is it almost certainly a solid piece of rock? I, I actually have no idea. I, I, I don't do asteroids really. Um, I, I, I think that's, uh, you know, going to be a very important part of interpreting um, the, the orbital change is, you know, do the pictures from, from DART as it closes in, you know, before the impact, it'll, it'll take, you know, lots of pictures um, and the presumably fairly small number of pictures We'll get from the leecher cube uh you know what will those tell us about the the internal structure of of uh, diamorphous and you know how does that structure play into how effective this um momentum enhancement you know this amplification factor um yeah it's going to be uh there'll be a lot of interesting science coming coming out of that even though the the main purpose of the the mission is you know planetary defense um yeah yeah, actually, and, and just to build on that, Ralph, uh, what, what Ralph said, uh, that's exactly, Rod, what the, the scientists want to know. Now, this, this these asteroids, uh, Dimorphos is an S-type asteroid, one of the most common types that we've seen out there, but they don't really know uh, what Dimorphos is made out of. They think, well, if it's that small and it's a moon of that, that asteroid, it's probably made out of the same stuff. How compact is it? That's what this planetary defense uh, test is supposed to find out, which then can give a baseline um, and I, I might have buried the lead, but this is like save the planet type of stuff that, that, right, that they're right. testing. And this is, it's the first test of its kind to show that we can actually move an asteroid uh, in, a, in a way that if we detected one that was going to hit us uh, in like five or six years, then you could launch a similar mission uh, with a much bigger spacecraft and, and try to do this, this type of movement. So it would miss the planet or at least all the, the, the the where you know, maybe we could steer it to a, a place where it would do less damage you know this is a uh uh didymos is the type that could destroy a city or large parts of a country but not the whole planet if it hit the if it hit us is what they told us on uh, on monday well thank god it doesn't involve space cowboys or nukes okay all right bruce willis uh, last up although he he, oh, he was also please. asked uh, uh, he was invited to the launch uh, but didn't make it so we'll see if he shows up for this one those are horrible movies. Um, okay, last up also from space.com. A change, a change in Jupiter's orbit could make Earth even friendlier to life, question mark? This one's for you, Mr. T. Oh, yeah. Well, this is, I, I picked this one because this was just a really fun science story <laughs> that came out uh, the, this week. Uh, but some scientists uh, uh, have determined that Earth, you know, is a comfortable place for humanity for the most part, but it could, in fact, be a little bit more comfortable if our orbit was a little more extreme so that we got uh that we approached a bit closer uh to uh to the sun over time it, it would um uh, uh it would basically make more parts of our our planet warmer which means that we could grow crops we could live we could have uh more uh uh, uh you know uh, just a, a more comfortable year-round uh, lifestyle but to do that we would have to make jupiter's orbit much more extreme extreme and, and elliptical as well so it looked more like an oval uh, shape uh which would take some pretty significant geoengineering i, I should say you know um to, <laughs> to, to yes. change it and and then there are also questions of do we really want the planet to be warmer anyway well we're already <laughs> doing of, that that's what that, i couldn't that, figure out it's like look this this process is underway right now why do you have to go move the largest planet in the solar system to speed it that, up that doesn't make that's a lot right of sense. That's right, but but it's just it's just a very interesting thought uh, thought problem that we could make um, our Earth a little bit more habitable for organisms, and then we might have much more uh, a much more prolific uh, what is that like a a spread of what life is uh, like? We wouldn't have extreme flowers because there wouldn't be those extreme environments uh, uh, as much to, for for places to to live. We'd have just like. You know, uh, files. I guess what is that? You know, something that's uh, that, that's easy. Um, I did learn that that a habitable range is thirty two degrees to two hundred and twelve degrees Fahrenheit. So I don't know if I'd want to live in the two hundred and twelve degree part of the Earth. Really, uh, well, I live but, in Los uh, Angeles, where it feels like that every summer. Ralph, <laughs> you're uh, getting close. From your background, does this sound like a good idea to you? 
Um, so I, uh, I've had the good fortune over the years to to write a, a number of books on on planetary science and aerospace topics, and I did one on the the history of planetary climate studies. I mean, you know, how how it was we figured out, you know, how warm Mars is and how warm Mars should be. You know, compared to some, you know, if you took Earth and put it at Mars's orbit, you know, would that be the same? Um, so uh, this this sounds like a, a lot, rather exotic um, kind of theoretical study, but you know, the, that there are probably places out there, other stars that have maybe Jupiters that are in orbits like the the ones they're exploring. Um, you know, an important aspect of of long term habitability is the stability of of orbits and um, the orientation of the the spin pole right uh, the so-called obliquity mm -hmm. and that's what what drives our seasons right that the the um you know the sun is is tilted with respect to to our, our equator um and the the planets play a, a big role in in those evolutions and you know drive our glacial cycles for example so you know understanding the uh, the different mechanisms by by which um you know climates can evolve is is still very very worthwhile yeah, and this study, it found out, uh, Rod, that if Jupiter was a lot closer to the sun than it is now, it's like what, like four hundred and sixty-one million miles away, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that it it would it would actually cause like a much more extreme tilt to the 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 Earth than what we see now. And of course, we see a lot of those super Jupiter so close to the sun everywhere. Uh, it's, it, it's just uh, 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 it's just crazy to think about that. And this this yeah. this uh, this study said that uh, we would have a you know, a lot of uh, extreme freezing, sub 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 zero temperatures from from that kind of an extreme thing. So, yeah, one of the the big uh, debates is um, uh, whether the moon is actually um, very important in maintaining Earth's habitability, because basically the the moon, you know, and Earth is very unusual in having such a such mm -hmm. a large satellite. Um, the the moon almost acts like a gyroscope, sort of stabilizing the Earth's tilt. Um, and if the moon weren't weren't there, perhaps the uh, obliquity the the tilt of the earth could have changed a lot and that could have led to much um much more extreme season or cycles um so it's uh, it's interesting to think about these possibilities because the, out there there are probably worlds that that are in that situation well i i look forward to this happening someday and my next maybe my next visit to devon island will involve beach chairs and my ties um <laughs> We'll be back to talk more to Ralph Lawrence of the Dragonfly Mission after this short message, so stay with us. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Melissa. Melissa is a leading provider of global data quality and address management solutions. Poor data quality can cost organizations an average of $15 million each year. Don't waste your marketing dollars. Be sure to manage your budgets effectively and smart, as the longer poor quality data stays in your system, the more losses you could accumulate. To ensure your business is successful, your customer information needs to be accurate as high quality data will save you money. Melissa recently partnered with IDPAL to launch Melissa ID for seamless contact verification in real time. Melissa ID is a unique, fully customizable, out of the box SaaS solution using a multi layered approach that includes biometrics, facial matching, liveness testing, address verification, and document checks for automated identity verification. Backed by Melissa's 37 plus years in address standardization, correction and verification, this new app offers coverage of over 6,000 identification documents across 200 countries and jurisdictions. Melissa ID is ideal for all types of businesses charged with reducing costs associated with customer acquisition, operations, fulfillment, and fraud. With Melissa, you'll reduce risk, ensure compliance, and keep your customers happy. Protect your data from decay with 2.1 billion clean, validated records. Ensure compliance in areas of anti-money laundering, AML, politically exposed persons, or PEP, and Bank Secrecy Act, or BSA. Score and target customers with detailed demographic and firmographic data appends. Complete customer service records. Add missing names, addresses, phone numbers, and email addresses and undergo independent security audits, and they are SOC 2, HIPAA, and GDPR compliant. Listen, duplicate information hurts your bottom line. Melissa's data quality suite will help eliminate clutter and duplicates, increasing the accuracy of the database, reducing postage and mailing costs. Melissa has batch address cleansing. You can process an entire address list for accuracy and completeness. Identity verification. Reduce risk, ensure compliance, and keep your customers happy. Geocoding enrichments, 
You can convert addresses into latitude and longitude coordinates. Email verification, remove up to 95% of bad email addresses from your database. And there's a lookups app on iOS and Google to search addresses, verify social security numbers, access detailed property data, and more at your fingertips. Make sure your customer contact data is up to date. Try Melissa's APIs in the developer portal. It's easy to log on, sign up, and start playing in the API sandbox 24-7. Get started today with 1,000 records clean for free at melissa.com slash twit. That's melissa.com slash twit. And we're back. And when Dragonfly arrives at Titan in about 2034, uh, at least as it's currently planned, as I understand it, it'll be the first quadcopter, or I guess more accurate, accurately an octocopter since they're uh, dual rotors to explore another world, then uh, Tark and I both have a bunch of questions, but I guess my first is, so far we've had one look at the surface of Titan beneath those dense clouds uh, with the Huygens probe from Cassini, which was incredibly cool. And uh, Titan was a bit of a surprise, I guess. It turned out to be a pretty amazing place. Can you describe what we learned from Huygens and what we know now about the surface of Titan that make it such an intriguing target? Yeah, I mean, there's uh, a whole range of reasons why Titan is a, an exceptionally interesting body in the, the solar system. I mean, you know, it's a it's a moon. Um, it's the second largest moon in the solar system, and it's bigger than the the planet Mercury. But what sets it apart is that it has a dense atmosphere. No other moon has um, such a such a, a thick atmosphere, and it's a, an atmosphere that's denser even than than our own. And that sets up um, a whole range of possibilities and, and phenomena, you know, interactions between the atmosphere and the surface, you know, that that uh, lets um, surface material get blown around by the wind, for example, and that uh, sculpted uh, vast fields of sand dunes that we see on Titan. But the, the, sand, the dunes are made not of silica sand like they are on Earth, but of a whole different set of materials on Titan, uh, water ice and, um, and organic materials. Um, Titan has a, a hydrological cycle. There's a you know, methane, which is a gas on Earth, uh, at Titan's temperatures so far from the sun. Uh, it's cold enough that, that methane condenses and forms clouds. Uh, and uh, these clouds will actually form rain and uh, rivers and uh, there are lakes and seas. So you have a very familiar um, set of landforms and phenomena like clouds but with different conditions and different working materials. So Titan's an, an outstanding place for um, what we might call comparative planetology. Um, it's also very rich in carbon materials, in organics. And what's particularly exciting about that is that, you know, while you know, we are 70% water, the most interesting part of us, you know, the chemicals that execute the functions of life, of metabolism, liberating free energy, uh, replication, and you know, information storage, those are all organic. And um, we know Titan's atmosphere is is very rich in in hydrocarbons and nitrogen bearing materials, um, and we think that on Titan's surface, um, and Titan's you know body is mostly water ice. We think. Um, there may be places where uh, that that water material has has melted, like uh, in a volcano or in a, um, an asteroid impact. And where that has happened, the water can interact with the hydrocarbons and nitriles and make all the amino acids and pyrimidines and you know some of these building blocks that may um, you know basically prove the stepping stone to starting life off. So, you know, there's a lot of astrobiological interest in, in Titan. Can I, can um, I and ask? What, what, um, oh. what, what Huygens showed us was, you know, this, this very Earth-like landscape up close, right? It, it, it happened to land in a stream bed. Um, there was a highland just, you know, five miles away that had river channels in it. And a little bit beyond that, there were a couple of, of sand dunes. I mean, it's a very diverse place shaped by the same sort of processes that, that shape things here on Earth. And that ground truth, you know, Huygens was was there. It made measurements, not for very long, because it was just just battery powered. Yeah. Um, but that really, you know, made Titan a place that we can understand, and uh, you know, has the engineering information, like the atmospheric density and so on, that we can then use to design follow-on missions. After Huygens did its thing, uh, Cassini was in orbit around Saturn for um, 
you know, 13 years, it made 120 some flybys of Titan and mapped, you know, much of much of the surface with radar and measured its gravity field and sniffed the atmosphere and you know did a whole range of very, very broad investigations. And that gives us sort of the, the big picture into which the, the ground truth at the Huygens landing site could get slotted in. So we have a pretty good sort of big picture, but Huygens wasn't equipped to um, measure the composition of the surface material. Uh, and that's right. one of the big goals of Dragonfly is to look for these sort of prebiotic molecules. Wow. I think that was actually my, my, my big follow-up question was why are we going back to Titan again since we've already landed there before? It's a question I get, you know, for, about the moon from a lot of readers too, uh, about why we're going back there. But, you know, as a, as a mission architect, what is that? What do you, what do, you do there, uh, Ralph? Can you kind of describe what that is to make a mission yeah. like Dragonfly succeed in? So, and so why send I, a helicopter? I, I so, so I think what the systems engineering management plan says, my, my role is, is to um, develop and communicate an integrated vision of how the, uh, the mission and its instruments operate in, um, in their respective environment. So I, I sort of straddle the engineering and scientific worlds. I mean, my, my undergraduate degree was actually in aerospace engineering, but over the years, I kind of started faking being a geologist and a meteorologist <laughs> and organic chemist and all these these other things. I mean, that's what makes Titan so interesting. There's all these scientific disciplines come into play. So what, one big part of uh, what I do is um, I lead the development of uh, one of Dragonfly's instruments, uh, so-called DragMet, the Dragonfly Geophysics and Meteorology Package. So it's a an instrument we're building here at APL, uh, to measure the wind and the methane humidity and the temperature and the pressure um, and also feel uh, through the skids a little bit of what the, the surface material is like. Um, and importantly, we uh, will measure the seismic activity uh, with some, some little geophones on the skids and we, we have a, a more sensitive seismometer uh, contributed from the Japanese Aerospace Agency that will will hope to look for uh, Titan quakes and thereby measure the internal structure of Titan. That's something we don't know very much about from Cassini's remote measurements. We think that there's an ice crust, maybe 50 or 150 kilometers thick, that sits over a, a water, you know, liquid water internal layer that like we, we think is present at Europa, for example, just, uh, just deeper down. And so that comes into the whole habitability of um, of icy moons of, of giant giant satellites. So, um, you know, some of these kind of measurements and, and also, you know, acquiring surface samples with with like a drill are are not very uh, common uh, features of rotorcraft of, of, you know, helicopters, right? One of the things drill designers like is, you know, a lot of weight on the drill bit uh, right. you want to push down. And of course, that's rather anathema to a vehicle that wants to take off again. So there's a whole range of interesting and very novel um, challenges with putting a mission like Dragonfly together, you know, not just to have it operate, you know, 10 AU from the Earth and send its data back through a, through a dish antenna all the way back to Earth to fly in an extraterrestrial atmosphere, you know, perform navigation by itself because the one-way light time is over an hour, right? We can't joystick this. We, we tell it where we want it to go, you know, fly, fly three kilometers, uh, you know, north-northwest and check out what's there and then come back to, to the present landing site. Um, but, it, you know, it has to figure out, you know, where the rocks are and not, not to land on them. Um, so there's all these, uh, you know, autonomous flight kind of questions uh, operating in the Titan environment in a you know, denser atmosphere, a very, very cold atmosphere. Um, but uh, they're also thinking through, you know, what are the scientific measurements we, we want to make? Um, so kind of putting a, a, all this together and, and catching um, some of the potential interactions that we need to watch out for um, and defining the environments, right? When you have engineers, you know, there's, there's an engineer that designs the rotor blades, right? And they, you know, they have their big textbook full of rotor blade sections and what the lift coefficients are. Um, and they want to know, you know, what is the speed of sound in the Titan atmosphere because that affects the Mach number and the drag and all that. Um, you know, the drill designers want to know the hardness. Uh, the radio people want to know how radio reflective the surface is and how, how much refraction happens in the atmosphere. And so developing all these engineering specifications of a planetary environment is a big part of what I do. And I'm very fortunate to to have the opportunity to, to do all this because, you know, I actually started out, um, you know, my first job um, was working for the European Space Agency 
uh, right at the beginning of the Huygens probe development. So I've, I've seen the sort of cradle to grave um, you know, formulation of these sort of specifications of the environment and how they affect the design, been through the actual building of instrumentation for Titan and then, you know, had the seven year wait while we get there um, and, and got then to analyze the data from it. So having that experience, um, you know, is, is, a, is a real asset to Dragonfly's development, I think. Yeah, it, it sounds super complicated to go straight from like Huygens, which was like a, a lander that was like maybe less than a day of, of, of you know, beaming back data to flying. <laughs> and I, I was curious, why make that leap to, to have something so mobile um, with with these different instruments that are on board and uh, from, you know, instead of maybe like a rover uh, or something that, where we've seen a lot that's of success. A, that's, a, that's a great question. So uh, shortly after uh, Huygens, um, back in 2007, NASA uh, commissioned APL to to look at a a big post Cassini Titan exploration mission. You know what what would you do? They said basically you know blank check. Um, and you know there's some questions you address from from orbit, right? We Cassini just flew by Titan, right? You'd be only close to Titan for an hour at a time. So even if you add up all those 120 flybys, it only adds up to you know a few days worth. So within a couple of weeks orbiting. Uh, Titan, you, you'd have much more observing opportunity than Cassini did. So you could put the same instruments from Cassini on such an orbiter and it would, would tell us amazingly wonderful things. Um, but of course you want to do the stuff that Huygens couldn't do, um, measure the weather over a Titan day. I mean, Huygens only uh, sent data for 72 minutes before Cassini, its relay spacecraft, went over the horizon. Um, and there was no guarantee that it would have survived anyway. Actually, we were very lucky to get what, what data we did. Um, so measuring the weather over the course of a Titan day, measuring the seismic activity over a Titan day or, or more. Uh, remember, Titan is tidally locked to Saturn, goes round Saturn once every 16 Earth days. Um, and our own moon um, you know, is in that, that same sort of configuration. And uh, moonquakes are modulated by the tides, right? It's the, the changing orbital distance that um, changes the stress in the, in the crust. Um, and then measuring the surface material. And... One point about that is uh, if you have a, a, a simple lander, you know, like Mars Pathfinder or, or something, then you kind of are stuck with whatever you happen to land on, right? You get one surface material. And we know from Cassini that Titan's surface is very diverse, right? There's, there's sands and there's mountains and there's lakes and, you know, there's different compositions in different places. And we, we, we're greedy. We want to measure them all, but especially those ones where we think the, the liquid water is interacted. And then there's a scale gap between what you see from orbit, a you know, thousand kilometers up, uh, and you can only see things, you know, 20 meters across or 100 meters across. Um, and what you see at that one landing site, you know, down to the sand grain size, there's a, a big gap. And we wanted to fill that gap with um, some sort of aerial platform. And we proposed a hot air balloon. There have been a lot of ideas <laughs> about ballooning on Titan. And, you know, these three different platforms, you know, would, would have lots of synergies operating get together. Um, but they, they kind of, picked at different parts of the puzzle. Anyway, that was all rather expensive and was in competition against uh, the Europa, um, a comparable Europa study, which eventually became uh, the Europa Clipper mission um, and uh, and the European Juice mission, actually. Um, um, and we, we sort of went back to the drawing board and meanwhile, the drone revolution had, had happened. And when you um, start thinking about, okay, uh, say we don't want to just take our chances and land by parachute, um, and, and you, given what we have from Cassini, there's, there's no way of saying, you know, there's a rock here, um, and there's no way of, of actually, you know, being sure that you don't land on that rock. You, you need some, some in situ capability to detect hazards um, and to, to, um, to, to move a little bit. And once you add that capability, you know, the same sort of capability that, say, the Perseverance rover um, and uh, landing system had, then um, if you execute the propulsion via rotors, which Titan's dense atmosphere and low gravity lets you do, then you don't need to add anything to let the thing take off and go somewhere else. So mm -hmm. the paradigm actually is of a, a relocatable lander. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not flying around all the time. I mean, it's, it's sitting there. Um, charging up a, a battery um, notionally with a, a radioisotope power source um, for, you know, a Titan day, several Titan days, you know, a month or two uh, at a time. And then it'll maybe fly for half an hour 
and and go somewhere new and interesting. So really, it's a lander that just happens to um, exploit the Titan environment and, and aerial mobility to to um, land in different spots. Huh. Like a flying mobile home, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sounds that, that's cool. <laughs> uh, that's not not a not a, a an unreasonable way to put it. It's it's not um it's not very pointy and fast like a, you know, a dedicated <laughs> aircraft would be. Right, we've got this you know one meter high gain antenna that we need to to beam the data back to Earth because there's no relay satellites at Titan. Um, we've got drills on the skids. Right, um, you know these are all features that do not make for a particularly um, you know, streamlined and fast vehicle. Everything is uh, an interesting compromise. Um, well, that's really interesting stuff. So, you know, when I saw your title, when I was looking at your bio, I saw Mission Architect, and I thought, so that means he's straddling both the science and engineering side, and I, I work up at JPL off and on, so I get to see those guys in the same room talking to each other, and I thought... Oh, I get it. The mission architect is the person that everybody argues with. That's, <laughs> that's, the uh, that, that's pretty good. I um, I wrote uh, an article for Aerospace America, which you can you can find online. It's called um, uh, "Engineers Are Dogs, Scientists Are Cats." It's a sort of rumination on the um, <laughs> the sort of different mentalities of of these two disciplines. I mean, we're you know we're we're all, and I say we, but, you know, having basically made the transition from from engineer to scientist and living in the middle ground. Um, you know, we, we, we have uh, you know, technical abilities, you know, it's all math, um, but a lot of it is communication. And um, mm. there are some different sort of, uh, you know, viewpoints and uh, mentalities associated with the two disciplines that it's, it's helpful to understand to, to foster that communication. Well, I've got a, a question about AI, which I will ask you as soon as mm. we come back from this short break. So I see that you've been looking at aerial exploration of other worlds for a couple of decades at least. And, you know, since you started looking at that, autonomous operations is something that kind of went, as I understand it anyway, from paper studies to to reality and something that we can begin to achieve. But we generally fly these older radiation-hardened uh, processors on these spacecraft that are, you know, maybe baselined and... 2000, 2010, um, because of the, the radiation and the environment, the fact that they're they're hardened and against that. How are you going to accomplish this on on Dragonfly? How are you going to accomplish the AI you need? So uh, AI is is sort of a strong term for for what we do. Um, there's no um, you know mental model on board of what Dragonfly is supposed to be doing. It's it's merely executing what we direct it to from the ground. Now, to do that, it has to know, um, you know, where it is, how high off the ground it is, how fast it's flying, in what direction. Um, and uh, like many spacecraft, many landers, it has a it's called an inertial me measurement unit, you know, that measures accelerations and, and angles to keep keep track of how it's uh, oriented. Um, but those uh, instruments uh, drift slowly uh, over mm. you know a whole half hour flight. Uh, you would um, have some inaccuracies building up, so you wouldn't be able to you know, fly exactly back to the same spot you took off from. So you need um, uh, some sort of machine vision, uh, some, you know, some sort of way of recognizing landmarks and measuring your speed you know, relative to the ground and measuring your position relative to, to those landmarks. And that's, um, that's a rather less sophisticated thing than, than AI. Um, and in many respects, it's uh, a lot like the sort of cruise missile guidance that was developed uh, at, at APL and, and other places in the um, in the 1970s and 1980s. I mean, we use um, you know much faster hardware now to do that and better better images. And and we have to take into account the fact that you know Titan's illumination is fainter than on Earth and and rather diff diffuse because of the the hazy atmosphere. Um, but another point is that because Titan's atmosphere is so dense. Um, it's uh, like uh, being under 100 meters of, of ocean in terms of the column mass of material um, above the surface. And that means that there, there isn't uh, space radiation at Titan. Um, it's you know, a, a oh. less um, strong radiation environment than the surface of the Earth. So okay. we, we don't have that cha particular challenge that is one that's you know, very severe, for example, at, at Europa. Oh, that's interesting. 
Yeah, you don't want an AI on flying your helicopter on Titan talking back when you want it to go look at this thing. And it's like, no, you know, I, I don't right. really we wouldn't want to take the, the fun of, from the science team. I mean, we, we want to be the ones figuring out where the most interesting places to go. Of course, there'll be um, a lot of very interesting discussions between the science team and the, um, you know, the engineers as to, um, you know, exactly where to go next. Right. The interesting places tend to be the rougher, more challenging ones. And the engineers want the hardware to be, you know, treated with very gently. Um, and so there'll be some interesting debates. Now, when those sort of debates happen on the Mars rovers, right, it's pretty brutal on the people concerned because the Martian day is um, like um, 24 and, and three quarter hours long. So you kind of have to turn the, these decisions around um, in, a, in an hour or two. And uh, at least in the beginning of the, the mission, you're on what's called Mars time, right? The, the operations have to be during the, the, the Mars day because, uh, you know, the robot arm and the actuators and things have to be warm to, to, to function. Um, and because the, ty the, the Martian day is just a little bit longer than an Earth day, that means that the Mars day slowly goes out of sync of the Earth's one. So all the, all the scientists and engineers get jet lagged. I mean, it's, it's really quite, quite tough from a um, you know day-to-day -day working perspective because on titan we have this uh, sort of 16 day cycle kind of eight days on eight days off right during the titan night dragonfly will be on the far side of titan not in earth view we can't talk to it and it's dark so what it's just doing basically is listening for titan quakes and uh, charging up its big battery right we fly with a, a big battery that um we, we use you know like half the capacity of it during our powered flight and then take 16 days to to charge it back up again um during that eight days of, of titan night you know we can be on regular office hours and think um carefully and deliberatively about uh you know what uh, what to do next with with dragonfly it's a much more um, human-friendly uh, cadence of, of operations. So, so you brought up a couple of things I wanted to follow up on real quick. Uh, we see in the press, not infrequently, the RTGs, the nuclear power supply, being referred to as nuclear batteries, and they're not. They're nuclear power supplies that charge a battery, and you just touched on how much power it's going to take. So, uh, you know, given the expected life of the vehicle, I assume that that dictates to some extent what your exploration strategy is going to be since you've got to you know, charge for a long period of time before you fly for a short period of time. So what is the overall strategy of how you're going to divide your time between the dunes and the lakes and the seas and other kinds of terrain? What are some of your primary targets? Yeah, so um, you know, we um, plan a, a mission of a, a few years and the exact number is, is still being sort of discussed. Um, because there isn't a hard cutoff, right? The, uh, the mission is designed on the assumption that we would use um, a multi-mission radioisotope generator, um, just the same as the one on, on Curiosity and Perseverance. Um, formally speaking, that, that still has to be approved um, in the National Environment Policy Act, uh, I guess. Um, but the expectation is, you know, we have this power source that um, not only gives us you know, 80, 100, 100 watts of electrical power, uh, which you know isn't a lot, but it's it's enough. Uh, Viking, you know, operated the same Curiosity, Perseverance, do do fine with that. Um, but very important for us is the um, the so-called waste heat. We get uh, almost uh, two kilowatts of heat from from the radioisotope generator as well, and that's absolutely crucial to staying warm on Titan because it has this um, this very thick uh, cold atmosphere. Um, so, uh, you know, ultimately the, the mission would become limited by actually that heat output. The, the lander would, would get too cold. Um, the electrical output goes down and that's frustrating because it means you can, can do less things, right? Every, every bit of data you send back to Earth or every centimeter you, you know, you, you drill or every kilometer you fly takes, takes some amount of energy and will, will partition that, that, that energy in the, you know, the most useful manner, um, you know, we, we, we can. Um, but, um, sorry, I forgot where I was going with this. <laughs> um, we, we, so we, um, you know, have a basic plan of, um, generally, you know, there'll be a checkout period. We'll, we'll stay at the first landing site for, uh, several Titan days, um, and explore it fully and check out all the systems and commission the instruments and so on, and then take a, take a little flight, right? You know, baby steps, um, check out that the, um, 
uh, the, the navigation system is working at the, that, that time of day and so on. And then generally speaking, the sort of plan we have right now is that we would fly every other Titan day, right? Um, basically, the battery gets filled up with a, a whole Titan day's worth of, of uh, radioisotope power. And on uh, one day, we will fly, you know, burn up half of that battery energy in, in half an hour, getting, you know, maybe... Uh, Maybe six kilometers, maybe maybe further, maybe maybe less, um, and going to a new landing site. And then once we're there, we'll communicate with the Earth a few times before it's uh, Titan sunset, and and that means Earth set. Then you know we'll take that Titan night, analyze the data, think about what to do next, and probably take a take a sample. You know, drill some surface material, analyze it. Um, and you know we'll be doing background measurements like weather and 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 time quakes as as well, and then maybe the third day fly again. So we have this sort of two two TESOL you know Titan day um, kind of operations cycle. And with that, we think we can you know say in three years you know maybe fly something like 150 kilometers or so. I mean you know wow. transformational distance, <laughs> right? Way way longer right. than any Mars rover has ever driven, but that's still not global distance. Um, uh, so we're actually not likely to go and explore the lakes and seas. They are all near um, Titan's North Pole. And, you know, the, the guiding principle, the, the priority for the mission is to explore these prebiotic, um, prebiotically interesting uh, materials that are associated with, with water um, organic interaction. And those we, we have evidence from Cassini, um, you know, are like, most likely to be found around a, an impact crater which is relatively near Titan's equator, um, so thousands of kilometers from the lakes and seas. So I'm afraid um, this particular mission is is not likely to to explore the the, the seas. But um, you know we know there's going to be quite um, quite diverse terrain um, in the landing site we've we've chosen. Initially, we'll land among the sand dunes because we can be confident from terrestrial analogs um, that the, you know, while the dune crests are steep, right, you don't want to land on the slip face of a dune. Um, but between the dunes, there are you know, sandy, uh, sometimes gravel-covered plains that are just going to be perfect landing sites, right? just dead flat and no rocks, and you know, any of the gullies have been filled in by the sand. So we'll start off somewhere where we're very confident about landing um, the first time because we won't have ground in the loop the first landing. And then with the scouting data we can we have from the initial descent, and we can you know do our own reconnaissance flights and come back to the the first landing that we know is safe, then we'll progressively work our way towards uh, this impact crater called called Selk, where we think these um, you know water uh, rich deposits have, um, have have appeared, um, and that will mean you know going to progressively rougher terrain but we'll know what it's like by that time right because we'll have the reconnaissance data so you know we'll see some some interesting and diverse landscapes um but probably lakes and seas won't be among them well you know the, I, I think i've got one basic question that you mentioned prebiotic uh, uh targets that you're looking for and i know i know we've talked about hydrocarbon lakes on titan before and and i'm just curious you know could dragonfly find evidence or signs of life on Titan for you know weird stuff for sure definitely right. not, so, not like so, we so the, Earth, the, the the word the word they like to use is is Loki uh, uh, life as we know it um, <laughs> so uh, life as we know it not, requires so that's not the, the not not the Loki TV show it's a it's a different no thing, no so. <laughs> it sounds similar but no um, you know life as we know it requires liquid water as the the mediating solvent um, and uh, Titan's just too cold. Right. It's simple as that. It's hundreds of Kelvin too cold. Um, so uh, there is the possibility, perhaps, of uh, habitable conditions in the deep interior, right, in this uh, water ocean. And that's why we're we're interested to know how thick the ice crust is uh, above that. Um, and maybe with this other things we can we can diagnose uh, seismically. Um, but as to the life as we don't know it, you know, exotic life chemistries that you know might work in liquid methane. As a solvent or or something, um, that's um, that's an interesting question. You know, what do you what do you look for, right? If it's not if it doesn't have DNA, 
you know you can't sequence it with you know the the, the tools we use to 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 keep measure the you know the the variance of the the covid virus um if it um if it doesn't respire you know carbon dioxide and you know the way that um living things do on earth then you know looking for for breath is not not going to be feasible but there are some general properties of um of living things and the chemistry making up living things um there's um a tendency for uh, living things to use building blocks um you know the way the molecules are are put together um you know relies on on some finite number of steps and so for example if you look at the fats in um uh sheep uh linolin right the um the fatty acids are all even numbered um numbers of carbon atoms right it adds a, a two carbon block uh when when um you know these um these uh fats are are built up in the in the sheep's metabolism um and so you can look for some of those kind of chemical assembly characteristics with our our mass spectrometer that um our, our colleagues at um Goddard Space Flight Center are 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 building um another uh property is uh what's called chirality there are some molecules the uh, amino acids in in proteins and some sugars are um have a structure that can have two forms that you know has the same number of atoms of each kind and they're kind of topologically the same but they're mirror images of each other as so called left-handed and right-handed and um living things for whatever reason on earth have chosen you know one-handedness right once once the, that selection has happened it sort of sticks it's like if some people decide to drive on the you know the right of the the road everyone has to drive on the right of the road or the whole system breaks down so similarly chemically uh once that uh convention if you like is adopted um uh it it tends to stick and if you look at you know amino acids in meteorites for example they're they're just a mix right they're equal equal amounts of the two-handedness so we have uh you know a, an instrument tool a gas chromatograph uh which actually comes from from France uh on dragonfly that um that can uh distinguish between uh these so-called stereoisomers huh. these these handedness so there's some general properties that would make us think very very carefully uh about the possibility of you know there being some chemical process that has the same sort of selection characteristics as life uh if i can put it that way that's right. a very good way to put it and for a guy who claims he's pretending to be a scientist you're doing a very fine job so i <laughs> if this is impressive um try. i i guess i just have the one big question left here which is you know i think it's very poetic that dragonfly will be landing in or near an area called shangri-la i, I was delighted to see that <laughs> um assuming that happens in in your opinion what might ultimate human exploration of titan look like or does that even make sense and do you see the possibility of a long-term facility either on the planet or in orbit that's an interesting question i i touch on that in a um... Uh, a book I put together on Titan, the uh, Haynes Owners Workshop Manual, actually a couple of years ago. Oh, um, that's brilliant! <laughs> there's um, there's uh, a, a, an interesting feature of the the Titan environment. You know, is there's low at, low uh, gravity and dense atmosphere. It'd be, you know, that's what makes it easy for a dragonfly to fly. It would make it easy to deliver, you know, large payloads like you know human payloads uh, to to Titan. Um, this is an exotic environment to explore. Um in fact um because Titan has this dense atmosphere it's not like Mars where if you walked out of your habitat with no spacesuit on you know the air gets sucked out of your lungs and you pass out in 10 seconds and right. die in, in a minute um you could you could hold your breath on Titan and and keep walking you <laughs> you you'd freeze in in due course um but uh, you you could also imagine that um you know a heated suit and an oxygen mask you know you you could walk around you, you wouldn't need a pressure suit So in in some respects it's um it's actually a very um uh, favorable environment for for human exploration. Um you you run into some interesting questions like if you imagine a you know a dome right your your warm pressurized environment you know it has to be has to be pressurized to tighten pressure so it doesn't collapse but you have some oxygen inside and you can breathe and all that. But if the air in your habitat is at you know 270 Kelvin uh, 280 Kelvin whatever you know room temperature and the air outside at the same pressure is at titan's 94 kelvin then your habitat is basically a hot air balloon and so you need to lash it down to the ground 
right? There's some interesting anchoring questions, oh, and you don't want the heat yeah. to leak out of the habitat into the into the ground and, and melt the ice. So you know, there's some some interesting um, architectural um, questions to to be addressed to figure out the best way for a, a human habitat. But certainly, uh, Titan is um, is it would be an exciting place to explore. It's a very carbon rich environment. Um, it's um, it was recognized by Arthur C. Clarke in the mid 70s as being, you know, a, an ideal fueling stop uh, for outer solar system uh, commerce and exploration. His book Imperial Earth talks about the, the howl of the ram scoops, you know, sweeping up some of the methane uh, from Titan's at- atmosphere to use as fuel uh, for 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 rockets. Um, so, yeah, long term uh, Titan would be would be up there. Uh, I mean, you know, getting a billion miles through through space to get to Titan is, um, you know, is a challenge that um, that with current technology takes us, you know, seven years, which is going to be a long, rather boring trip. Um, but maybe <laughs> once we have uh, different propulsion technology and can get there more quickly, uh, Titan would definitely be a destination of interest. Well, Ralph, I, I, we, we both want to thank you for making time for us today. And thanks to you, our listeners, for joining us for our visit with Ralph Lawrence, who is, wait for it, truly one of the titans. I just had to get that in there. <laughs> uh, uh, R- Ralph, it. where can we uh, go to track what you're doing and learn more about what's coming up for you? Because you're involved yeah, in a lot so, of cool um, things. Dragonfly uh, has a, a website. I think a, a Google search will will find it very easily. Um, we have a lot of uh, animations and uh, good features there. Um, uh, if you're interested in my own particular contributions, uh, I'm also uh, amenable to being searched online. Um, I think uh, you know there's a few books that people might be interested in. Um, so yeah, just uh, use the use the use the magic of modern technology. And I assume your books are uh, the ones that are still in press or, or on Amazon. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, your uh, favorite online book retailer will will have them. Uh, my most recent book was just published by the uh, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. It's um, called Planetary Exploration with Ingenuity and Dragonfly: uh, Rotary Wing Flight on Mars and Titan. You're just kind of laying out how uh, the Mars helicopter is, you know, in a different environment and has different goals and has a very different design. Uh, from Dragonfly, but um, you know we're really um, in an exciting age now, where planetary uh, flight is is a thing. It's uh, really exciting for someone like myself who started as an aerospace engineer and got into the science. Well, and it was something we we dreamed about for so long. Well, thank you very much, Tark. Where can we stay current with all things Tark? Well, as as always, uh, as always, uh, I'm at space.com for all the latest space news. You can find me on Twitter at Tarek J. Malik, and apparently uh, back in Florida again for Artemis launch number three uh, to see if they if they can get off the ground. And we'll keep our fingers crossed and, and hopefully get to the moon. <laughs> Everybody's so, crossing fingers. And of I'm course, you can go always... my chair, Rod. So no, <laughs> we'll see about you. that. You can always stalk me at pilebooks.com or at astromagazine.com, my favorite magazine. Don't forget to drop us a line if you wish at TWIS at twit.tv. That's TWIS at twit.tv. We always welcome your comments, suggestions, and ideas, and we answer each email we get quickly and personally. Thanks for joining us. It's been fun as always, and if you have anything to say about it, do drop us a line. New episodes publish every Friday on your favorite podcatcher, so make sure to subscribe, tell your friends, and give us reviews. I'm always begging for reviews. It's not dignified, but here I am. We'll take five stars. <laughs> Thank you very much. You can also head to our website at twit.tv slash TWIS. You can follow the Twit Tech Podcast Network at Twit on Twitter and on Facebook and twit.tv on Instagram. Do it all because we're that cool. Thank you, and we'll see you next week. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support. <laughs>